Welcome again to another edition of What People with Disabilities Teach Us. I'm your host, Mike Delaney, and today we have some very special guests from St. John's United Church of Christ in Bellevue, Kentucky. We have back with us again Dean Griffith and Connie Mulcahy. Mahaney. <laughs> Mahaney. <laughs> Father Mulcahy. <laughs> and Dale Sexton. Uh, and we're grateful that you all could be with us. And we're going to talk about a church that has done as much as any local church I'm aware of in terms of uh, accommodations and upgrading its facilities for people with disabilities. And we're going to uh, talk specifically about some of the improvements that have been made in the past and recently or are in process of being made. And we're going to share some personal stories about uh, what folks have known in their time of need regarding the church's outreach when, when they needed it. So, uh, without further ado, we'll begin with the same way St. John's begins every Sunday morning. Greetings in the name of our loving God, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome and included here. Dale, you chaired the access to all committee, which is, if I understand it correctly, A2A is about being certified by the United Church of Christ denomination as an accessible to all congregation. Go Correct. Ahead. It's not just saying we have um, a, a um, ramp or other facilities. It's looking at the whole picture. It is looking at a physical building. Uh, but it's actually looking at the physical building minutely as in a thresholds, water uh, coolers, how high are they, um, is the lighting adequate, but then you also have a mental compound on it. Um, how are you going to treat people with disabilities? Are they going to be able to function at the, uh, in the church house itself and get around? Um, if it's for children, is it a safe environment, as in uh, safe blocks, you know, mm -hmm. that they can use? Uh, are there uh, accessible desks if children are in a wheelchair? Um, it's also if people are on the spectrum, and you know the spectrum is very wide. How do you deal with individuals when it might not be their best day, but it's just? A day that we need to deal with and uh, we've taken a very long look at this process uh, we've been building on it for a while uh, we've installed um, a ramp because it is a three-story building uh, we've installed an, an exterior ramp from the an apartment. exterior ramp um, uh, we've installed an elevator to get to so all floors are accessible uh, accessible restrooms and so now our next big push is to try to get to this A to A designation by our denomination. Uh, it's just a way that if people want to know that what church uh, in the area has these um, benefits, I guess, or that might not be the best word, um, okay. this, is the, this is the church that you might want to go to. Uh, the A to A people, uh, they strive on their little motto is uh, anybody, everybody, and Christ's body. So we're trying to include everybody on whatever level they're at. We want to make sure that they're going to be comfortable in that space. And just to help our viewers and listeners uh, picture the church, it, it does, the front of the church sits up above street level. Yes. With concrete steps to walk up. So you've, you've had your challenges, and, and at one time there, the parking lot is not that old, am I correct? Correct. Uh, the parking lot's probably about two years old. Um, so that was the first hurdle, is to get a parking lot and uh, to make and that. It is pretty much on the church's level, not the street level. Right. It's eight feet up. Uh, it's on a grade. Uh, and then that's where the ramp comes in because actually the ground level is... Um, a little bit below the f uh, the main level we have a very large basement area um, and if we didn't have this elevator installed as soon as you walk in the door 
you've got some stairs, just three, but three stairs means a lot to some people. And we understood that, and so we went with the parking lot with some uh, accessible spacing, uh, a ramp to get them to the main floor, and then an elevator to take them up and down. And, I mean, this didn't happen all at once because you are not a mega church. No, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> Average attendance on Sunday morning, 65 to 70? Around there, it might be a little bit, it's about 100 members, and we probably go north of uh, 75. Okay. And not a new church, I mean, goes back to the 1830s. Not a new church at all, and it's, uh, it's an old building. If we're talking about the building thing, it's a beautiful building. Um, but with the beautiful old building, you have problems with accessibility. Uh, and so we have made our way through this process uh, and we're you know, working on uh, tweaking the, the finite things that you know, uh, to do. There, it is a learning curve. It's not just not putting the ramp. It's saying, oh, you're done. It's a learning curve with people, with, member, with uh, members who are at our church, how to treat individuals. It's um, understanding individuals and what their needs are. So it's a very large process, really, if you think about it. And uh, we're on the back side of it, let's say, right now on uh, teaching and training the different people. Even in the first go-round of improvements, you removed a pew? We removed several pews. We removed uh, some front pews. We removed a middle section of pews. Because sitting in a pew is not an option for a person in a wheelchair or with a walker and those kinds of Or size, yeah. uh, you know, uh, even uh, people of a certain size. Uh, we did bring uh, communion down to ground level. We also um, went to, uh, um, we have uh, for communion gluten-free options. Uh, we have alcohol-free options. Um, so if there's a problem there, we want to make sure that everybody's welcome at the table. Uh, and when we actually do have uh, dinners downstairs, we try to also offer gluten-free uh, items. Um, that's one thing that popped up on our radar is that we need to do that. We did that many years ago, but bringing communion down to the uh, base level that everybody can do it. And if you couldn't move even out of the pews, we, we do bring it to the, um, to the individual um, when we're having that type of a communion that you uh, intention. And again, not just with A2A, which is ongoing at the moment, but you, you brought in a, a person to sign uh, at least once yes. a month and hearing devices and... Uh, we, we do have ASL that goes on uh, the first Sunday of the month and throughout the year on special uh, days that we do um, also have signing. Uh, we actually, this year, we had a signer at our jazz concert in February. Um, the jazz singer wanted it. She wanted to do that for the community, and we made sure that there was a signer there to, to sign for uh, her singing. That's a unique perspective that we said, that's not a problem. Um, uh, so you, you haven't, if I'm hearing correctly, you haven't had a lot of resistance from the congregation to making these changes. Uh, would it be fair to say, by and large, they've been supportive? I. I would say, by and large, they've been supportive. Uh, it's a, it's a, it, our, our church is runs the gamut on what type of people go there, um, uh, socioeconomical, um, um, different people from old, different types of religions go there. They find it welcoming. Um, it's a congregation that likes to question what's going on uh, in society and what's in the Bible and how is that going to per pertain to us today. Um, United Church of Christ denomination is a lot like that, but we're one of the denominations that um, every, when we say everybody's welcome, everybody is welcome. 
Um, if we're skipping something, we will try our best to make that happen. You, and so when I read what I read earlier, wherever you are on life's journey, uh, the emphasis is definitely with people with disabilities, but it also uh, relates to folks with sexual orientation, racially and ethnically. I've been to St. John, and you can, uh, while it's predominantly white, Caucasian, uh, certainly uh, there's a representation of, of Asian, African American, um, gender-wise, I think, Say, fair to say female leadership uh, as well as male leadership. Mm -hmm. am, I, am I on, on mark? Mm -hmm. I say yes. Okay. So inclusion is with regard to disabilities, but not just that. That is uh, an ethos, a value of, of the church. Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, how's it looking with A2A? I mean, you as I understand it, you've wrapped up your committee work and you're ready to present. Where's it at? Yeah. We have sent it in to the uh, United Church of Christ Home Office, which actually that is the um, United Church of Christ Disabilities Ministry, to say, here's what we've done. Uh, and then they, there's a checkoff list and what we're planning on doing on changing some things up. Uh, so we had to scrutinize details a little bit. Um, we think there's going to be a very good chance that we get this um, entire, this. Um, I have the checklist and you've, you've managed to just about hit all the items on the list with hardly any exceptions. Uh, I won't say 100 percent, but. It's not a hundred, yeah, we're not a hundred percent. Some of it is a funding issue and that's all it is. Um, th there's nothing on the list that really con the congregation has not spoke about at some particular time uh, that, that would ever cause us to question it. It's just now we, we have a, uh, a committee that said we want to do this and there's a task force to say let's get this done and um, I, I think the church has been very impressive on how forward thinking they're, they're moving on um, just not what somebody would say would be my needs, but what is the other person in the community, what are their needs? Okay, just so our viewers can get uh, an understanding, I'm gonna read off the major categories on the list. Attitudinal accessibility, and are persons with disabilities being included in uh, the audit? And does the church offer regular educational opportunities for congregants. That's a major category, communication, and it goes into large print and uh, audio devices and so forth. Are there large, uh, next large category, leadership. Does the pastor have disability awareness? Yes, Keith, we, we think <laughs> they've been working. He has some hearing uh, loss in one ear. Uh, physical accessibility, we've, we've talked about that in terms of ramps and even things like, I know you've addressed uh, fragrances mm -hmm. and, and sensory issues that people may have. Uh, stairs, and, and there's been a lot of work with regard to that, ramps and curbs and walkways, just to give our folks at home an understanding, elevators and lifts, you've addressed that. Restrooms, you mentioned that, water fountain, worship space, and classrooms. So, pretty, Pretty comprehensive uh, facility overview? Yes, um, we worked on it very hard on trying to uh, get everything measured correctly and then how we can explore the new, op uh, the new way of doing something as in, let's put another mechanical door here so that if somebody is in need, if they're using a walker, they don't have to struggle with going through an inside door. So it's a, not yet a, I mean, we have a mechanical door outside on the ramp, which that's like some people do, some people don't, we do. But on the inside, let's make sure they feel like they're not struggling on a door that they may need to get from point A to point B getting into the sanctuary, Okay. which is the main meeting area. Good luck with passage. I, uh, I mean, it's... Uh, 
not only admirable, it's, it's difficult for me, and, and my understanding isn't uh, regional-wide or area-wide of every church and, and uh, gathering place, but uh, your denomination has certainly attempted to address specifics, and you have responded to, the, to those specifics, not once, but twice as a church. As I understand, Sandy Curlin, who's formerly with the inclusion, Greater Cincinnati Inclusion Network, and prior to that, special needs teacher and so forth, had a strong background, and she was, she was important. Uh, she was in the lead with regard to the, the first round of upgrades, mm -hmm. and she's participated in this. She couldn't be with us here today. But, she's a great resource. Uh, and, and deserves a, a shout out mm -hmm. in absentia. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dale. We're gonna gonna turn to these other folks. Uh, Connie, I, I wanna move. This program focuses a lot on relationships because what we hear from experts and professionals that, that interact with people with disabilities that the most important thing are their, their support community yeah. support and so people are huge uh, and, and oftentimes therapists or medical staff will say I have them for an hour a week or every other week and the rest of the time they go back to their environment you've had a couple of, of bouts with cancer actually I've had three okay um, not not counting um, skin cancer, but um, in 2019, I was misdiagnosed with ovarian cancer, um, and because of my age, I was, it was recommended to me that I have a hysterectomy. Um, but when, they, when the, the surgeon did the hysterectomy, he realized that what they had been seeing on the films was actually my appendix. So I had the appendix removed. They brought a different surgeon and they removed the appendix. Um, part of my colon to be sure they got all the cancer. The appendix was full of cancer. The, the ovary was fine. But um, That's good. after that, the following year, I went for my normal mammogram, which was about six months later, and uh, they found breast cancer. Now, what year did they find the, the breast cancer? In 2010. That okay. was the following year. It was about six months after I had gone through the other surgery. In 2009. Right. So, um, <clears throat> I had a lumpectomy done. I had, um, I had to have um, radiation chemotherapy. And while I was going through a long bout of chemotherapy, a lump popped out of my neck. Oh. Um, <clears throat> which turned out to be a third separate cancer, um, which wasn't responding, of course, to the the radio or the chemotherapy for my breast cancer. So um, <clears throat> that after that, um, they added on to the chemotherapy to include new chemicals for the throat cancer. And then I had to go through a, a bout of um, 35 radiation treatments where they shot radiation through my head. <laughs> um, and somehow or another, praise the Lord, I, was, I came through that all, all right. That was three cancers in one year. And I got through it all fine. I wasn't expected to ever be able to swallow again. Um, I eat like a pig. <laughs> I wasn't expected to, I, I was expected to lose part of my voice. I was expected to lose my taste sensation. I was expected to lose all my teeth, and you can see I still have them. Um, <clears throat> but I got through that, and I believe that it was, I believe that God wanted to keep me here for a while for a reason, but I also believe it was because there was a lot of people praying for me. Um, but 
that brings up a thing, the, the accessibility thing that I think is really important for people to know. And that is that um, in a case like my case, um, you, people want to help. People from my church wanted to help. They wanted to visit. Um, they wanted to bring food. Um, they did send cards. They, they sent me a prayer shawl. Um, which made which felt really good. The elders had all prayed over the prayer shawl. Um, but what I think the people don't understand is when you're when you're really critically ill like that, especially with going through all that radiation and chemotherapy, your immune system shuts down. You can't be around people. You can't go out. Um, in my case, I had a feeding tube I couldn't swallow. So um, it's not that I wouldn't have welcomed food to come into the house because David would have, I'm, I'm sure, appreciated it. But it's a funny stigma with, with something like that when you're, you're not really expected to live. I think sometimes the um, church kind of lets you down. They're, they're like, they're there for you for a while and then it kind of falls off. People don't understand when you say, I really would rather you didn't come over. But the truth of the matter is, you can't afford for, to be around people right? Um, for your, your own sake. Um, but I do, um, I do think it's an important thing for folks to know that when, they, when you are dealing with people like this, keep the cards coming. Um, you know, um, I, you know, you need to feel like you're still around. You still, people still know that you're around. You know what I hear you saying, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Connie, I hear you saying that you still need to hear you're not alone. Exactly. Even, you might be isolated in the hospital, but you want to know you're not, that's different from being alone. And you want to hear somebody say, I'm still praying for you. And in that sense, you're not alone. You know those prayers are still going out for you. Um, I think it's, um, since that time, I've probably had, I've had too many surgeries to even talk about um, for different reasons. But the, the one thing I do want to say is even, th this is only nine years ago when my first, cancer diagnosis was but even that that length of time ago people and I th still think it's true people are when you say you've got cancer they think death sentence or they think you know sometimes I think people think they might catch it from you you know yeah. um, and there is a stigma that goes along with cancer um, or at least th there really was at that time. And people didn't, you know, when they say, oh, you, they just kind of pronounce you gone. Um, and I think it's important to keep people, you know, keep them in your mind, keep them in your prayers, keep them, keep, um, keep telling them that you're thinking about them. Do we teach our churches how to do that? May I say something about that? Yes, that's what we're here for. <laughs> well, when, um, I, you know, my husband and I just recently, like within the last um, year and a half, um, came to St. John Church. Um, but we, the church we were with before, um, I was pretty involved before I got sick. Um, then I, you know, obviously couldn't do as many things as I could do before. Um, but I, the, one of the elders in the church, um, her, her husband got very ill and she was taking care of him at home and I made a big pot of chicken soup and I called her and I said, I'm coming over, I'm bringing you soup and I brought her a, set, I brought a whole meal. Um, I knew her husband couldn't eat, but I knew that she needed something to eat. Right. 
And she said to me after that, she said, you just taught me a great lesson. She said, I know how many times I've called you and said, do you need anything? And I said, no. She said, you didn't ask me. You just did it. And she said, that taught me a lesson that I think people should understand. Most people will tell you, no, I don't need help. And my daughter even brought this up today, that she said, the Christian thing is actually to let people help you because it makes them feel wonderful. And certainly try to use our imaginations about specific things we might be able to do. Mm -hmm. uh, creative things in addition to the, the, the basics. Right. And I, I like to say, any errands you need to have run, anyone I need to contact on your, for, for you and make suggestions, just a uh, memory jogger, you know, right. uh, rather than just a blanket, anything you need, let me know. <laughs> well, that's, you know, that's, that's hard for people to, 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 to respond to most of the time. So yeah, I'm glad you used that illustration. And also, I wanted to just, um, just as a heads up for St. John Church, I, um, my husband and I came to St. John's. We were so welcome there. Um, we're just an old couple, you know. Um, but we were so welcome there. And not long after I, we started coming, we fell in love immediately. And not long after, I wound up having surgery. Um, and I was in the... I was in the um, hospital and I had a reaction to the morphine and I thought the nurse was trying to kill me and I had Pastor Keith's number and I called him and he was at his mother's visiting his mother and he called me I left a message and he called me back from vacation and said, I know what's going, what, what's going on with you. And he helped me to the point where I can't explain it. I was scared to death. Um, and um, Sue and he both came and visited me as a, as a new member. Um, and so I just wanted to say that. that so it's not just the physical attention that people uh, can benefit from, but also uh, Addressing the anxiety exactly. that people experience. And and if I'm talking out of school here, then Pam, our producer, can edit this next piece. But uh, you've even uh, most recently been uh, having some visual impairment uh, uh, that, that many of these things that A2A is uh, addressing. I think that's probably the reason that Sandy asked me to be on the committee is because I do have vision issues. I have um, macular degeneration and it's the dry kind that's already done its damage. Um, they don't expect it to get any worse except that with age your eyesight just gets worse. So it's, you know, um, you know, I'm kind of holding on to my driver's license with, you know, um, the um, you know, it, 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 the um, print size is a big problem for me. Um, so, I mean, it's wonderful to have the large print. It's, it's also, I've, you know, I've been able to, to um, bring up some things that I've, I've noticed that I can't see, um, like, you know, labels where, where things are, like when we, when we put a sign-up sheet out, I might have trouble finding the sign-up sheet. Because in general, the church is not very well lit. I mean, you don't want the sanctuary to be lights like this, you know. But it's a church where you feel like you can ask someone. I can, yes. I feel very, very much so. So that's um, important. We do the music. Um, there are hymnals in the pews. But we also have large print um, uh, ran off for people who need large print if they can't read the hymnal. So those are the steps that when we realize here's a problem, what's the easiest way to fix that step? That's meant a lot somebody. to me on every other Sunday when I forget my reading glasses. <laughs> well, you know, the funny thing is, it's like with the, um, the large print music and, the, and also the large print, um, the Bible readings, which is also something I can't read. 
I still use my magnifying glass. The reason, I mean, it's still not quite big enough. It's big enough for me if I was sitting in a good light. But in the, in the sanctuary atmosphere, it's not, it doesn't work for me. But I could never hold a hymnal and my magnifying glass and try and do this. So it, it, it helps me tremendously, even though it doesn't solve my problem completely. Yeah. It helps tremendously. My husband um, has been having some problems with the, you know, shaking a little bit, which I notice a lot of elderly people do. And, and, it's, and I told him he should start using, taking advantage of that because it's kind of hard for him to leaf through the, the hymnal. Um, one of the things that we, we're here for today is to commend the work that's been done, the very good work that's been done, but it's a work in, in process. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's made us all really understand and look closer at ways where we can, we can see things that we didn't see before. Now that we have this checklist to go down, it's made us realize, oh yeah, oh yeah, this, we can improve on that. Thank you for sharing. It takes some courage. I ask a lot of people to be on this program and don't always get a yes because they're camera shy and, and you've done beautifully, Connie. Thank you. I'll give Dean a chance to share some of his experiences, not only as a chaplain, but you were on the program last time and shared with us that both your dad many years ago and quite a few years ago, your, your mother-in-law, Carol's mother, mm -hmm. uh, both succumbed to, to Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. uh, can, we've never had someone on the program to talk about that. Can you share some? And it intrigues me that we'd want to talk about that in the context of the church. Um, and I, I'll, I'll deal with it from that perspective because both of the people in, in my life that had Alzheimer's were incredibly active in their respective churches. My dad was a trustee and a deacon and pick your, pick your office. He held them all. He, he literally physically built the church. He was a contractor. When he decided to build a new church, he built it for them. Uh, and uh, mom did a little bit of everything. So here's this guy in the church that's been very, very active. He had early onset what at first was called dementia because it, in those days they could not diagnose Alzheimer's until an autopsy was done. And so that all they could tell us was this is some sort of early onset dementia. We think we know what it is, but it's not going to get any better to our earlier conversation. Um, and in the beginning, people would come to the house when he had to quit work. People would come to the house. And it slowed to a trickle, and pretty soon it stopped. Even members of the family told my mother, I just can't bear to see Marsh that way. And so they didn't bother to come. I was away in college, and I would get back as often as I could. Um, but for all practical intents and purposes, some of the women would come, somebody would stay with Dad while Mom went out and did calls or something, mainly so she could get away and do the church work that she had always done. But there wasn't a whole lot of it, fr quite frankly. And I heard about that, and and I I heard it here. Mm -hmm. and that was the church that I'd grown up in. Well, time passes. He reached a point where he was totally non-communicative. He couldn't, he didn't speak at all. Some would whistle or hum or whatever. And sometimes he just didn't do anything. About six months after he stopped speaking, I was at home for a weekend to give mom a break. And he and I were standing on a sidewalk in front of the house. And just as clear as a bell, out of the clear blue sky, he put his hand on my shoulder, which was common. He did that to me with some regularity. And he said to me, you know pretty soon you're going to have to put me away. Hadn't said anything to anybody that made any sense in six months. But he understood enough of his own condition to know that we were going to have to put him away. And in those days, that was the only choice. There, was, you did, there weren't homes and special places for such people. We had to go to court and have him committed to the state hospital. That had to be emotional. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but it was at the same time, 
you can't imagine how much easier it was because we knew that he understood. We knew that he understood. Fast forward, ultimately I went into the ministry and I pastored churches for a time and so on. And I watched how churches behaved with their members 25 years later who had Alzheimer's or some form of dementia. What did they do? How did, um, and there's just all kinds of things that I, could, that I could point to that happened now that didn't happen then. One man I recall specifically in one little church I served, um, he came down with this, and for a very long, he had always sung in a choir, and for a very long time, the men in the choir took turns picking him up for choir practice and picking him up for Sunday morning, and he would go up and stand in his place in the choir, and even if he didn't know the words or it was a new song, he'd hum along, even when, again, even when he was not communicative. He could still pick up, there was something there. When I would visit with him, I found that if I said the Lord's Prayer with him, or if I said, picked something common out of the, the liturgy of the church, he would remember the words and repeat them with me. Even though he didn't remember much of anything else. So especially long-term memory as opposed yes. to working memory. Yes, yes. Um, and I've seen that in other people with, with dementia and with Alzheimer's and so on. This, this kind of flash, uh, another story. When Carol's mom was in the nursing home and she was pretty much gone. Um, Again, when, for the audience, Carol's your Carol's wife. my wife, my mother-in-law. And um, when uh, uh, May was uh, in, the, in the home, her husband was never even sure at this stage of the game that, he, that she recognized him. I always, always knew that Dad knew that I was somebody because of the... the there was just a communication between us when I'd go pick him up at the VA hospital. And, but anyway, Dick never knew whether his wife knew him or not, my father-in-law. Mm -hmm. And when he died before she did, one person went over to tell him, part of the family, and used a euphemism trying to find a way to communicate with her. And it just rolled off. It had no meaning for her. When somebody else went and said point blank, your husband Dick died, she got it. So we don't know what's going on inside of the minds of people who have Alzheimer's, who have dementia. Uh, I'm sure there are plenty of, of medical people and, and great scientific minds and people who have done autopsies and, and, and MRIs of functioning and dysfunctioning brains that would tell me, oh, there's nothing there. I'm sorry, I respectfully disagree. And that's the point at which I see the church having a needed role in reaching out to these people, and it comes back to what we've been talking about. It's the relationship. It's how do we connect with them? How do we... Continue to be a presence. Continue to be a presence, but how do we, you know, the old telephone ad, reach out and touch someone. How do we reach out and touch them physically with a touch on the arm or a touch on the hand or mentally by saying something that rings a bell somewhere in that tangled web. And new, new methods are coming out all yes. the time in terms of yes. how to communicate with people with Alzheimer's and dementia and other things. Don't argue with them. Oh, they're not after you. Quit that. Mm -hmm. But rather, oh, are they close by? What, does that, yeah, yeah, what does that feel like? And these are things anybody can do yes. and, and when they in, ah. are in the presence and encounter someone. And there, and there you touch on one of the things when we ask, how can the church do ministry with these people? If we believe what we say, then we are all part of the body of Christ, and we are therefore ministers of it. And we have each a responsibility, wherever we are, to be the church. And if that person who is there with us is disabled in any means, by any means, then we're the church together. You, know, you mentioned the, the fact that I've done some chaplaincy work. One of the things that I struggle with in the here and now is many, many, many churches uh, have come out against various and sundry wars that this country's fought. Well, whatever you may think of that, of the wars and, and whether or not they're legitimate and so on, 
We ought to look at the people that come back. We got to understand uh, that veterans have one of the highest suicide rates in the country. That's mental illness. PTSD is a mental struggle. How does the church deal with that? How do we reach out to those folks? What can we offer in the context of worship? What can we offer in the context of home? I had one young man just immediately after Vietnam that dropped out of a church that I was serving. And he, I, I talked to him for a long time and I said, I thought you were happy here. Uh, you know, I thought you found something. He said, well, you know, I said, this is gonna be weird, but I guess I gotta say it. So I'll, I'll say it here in this context as a caution to the churches. He said, after what I saw in Vietnam and what I lived through and what I did and what I saw done, to come back here and listen to people ready to quit the church and, and revile each other over what color should the seat cushions be, I just can't stand it. Oh. I cannot be a part of an institution that is that petty after what I've been through. I want to revisit when we come back. We're going to take a break, but I want to pick up on how we relate to a great variety of disabilities. Yes. How, how do we be the people that you so, adic uh, so eloquently uh, referenced a moment ago, uh, whether Christian or other religions and so forth? Uh, after the break, I want to come back and, and spend some time on that. back again with members of St. John United Church of Christ in Bellevue, Kentucky. And once again, the affirmation that begins each worship on Sunday morning for this inclusive church is no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome and included here. And we've been exploring with a little bit of breadth, breadth and depth that people can be in a, a lot of different places on life's journey. In fact, literally, it's hard to reach everybody in every place they might be. This is an affirmation, and affirmations are, are aspirations. This is, you know, this gives us hope of what we want to do. But we may sometimes, people could, can fall between the cracks. Mm -hmm. and, and furthermore, all of us as human beings, I know me, I don't know what to do in every situation. And so there's still work to be done in terms of education, I'm assuming. And I wanted to, to explore with our guest, with Dale and Connie and Dean. I, I often talk about when I'm addressing learning disabilities, three major executive functions of the brain. Working memory, something called cognitive flexibility, my, my friend Zach Hart, refers to it as mental flexibility and and also inhibitors uh, inhibitors just mean mm -hmm. impulsive mm -hmm. uh, lack breaks <laughs> boundaries Bound <laughs> I suffer from all three I want to you know I um, has anybody seen my keys why did I just come into the kitchen <laughs> I know none of you have that problem <laughs> working memory uh, also, uh, I do have some impulsivity. I'm working on it. I didn't know that about myself until my late 50s. I'd lived life and doggone, I was as impulsive more than I wanted to know about. And finally, and the one I've wondered about with regard to churches is mental flexibility. How easily do we see different perspectives? <clears throat> and I Excuse say me. that saying, I struggle, in fact, with my particular learning disability. The counseling I receive, the adaptation technique, was one of the things I needed to do was, Connie, this is how I see it, but how do you see it? I, I always need to check in if I'm hanging the picture with somebody standing in the background saying, is it straight yet? Mm -hmm. All the pictures I deal with in life, I need to collaborate not just rely on my own judgment. So, 
How's Excuse the me. church doing with mental flexibility? In, in your, and, and relating to people with disabilities. That's a good question. Um, do we always know there's a problem? I mean, do we recognize it? Sometimes people are very depressed and you don't know it. Sometimes people are very, um, they might be might have a horrible, serious problem, an addiction or something like that. You wouldn't necessarily know it. How do you, uh, how do you know these things? You can't help someone that you can't fix something that you don't know is broken. Were you going to respond, Dean? Yeah, it seems to me that whether we're in the church or in the body politic one of the things that we most need to do is to learn how to listen to each other. Uh, if that person that's standing behind you watching the picture on the wall gives you an honest answer and you ignore it, that's one thing. If on the other hand they look away and, they, and you ask the question and say, oh, it's okay. The first thing we need to do, I think, as individuals within the church for the church's sake and within the body politic, everybody talks about how divided we are and how, how civil discourse is non-existent. We need to listen to each other. And learn how to tell the truth in love. Yes. That's a, a balancing act. Yeah, but <laughs> listening to me is more important than anything I have to say. Yeah, well, absolutely. But if you're asking my feedback, mm -hmm. To, to pause and say, now how do I deliver this in a way that Dean's going to be able to hear? Do I communicate directly or indirectly? I got a terrible habit. I, I'm a direct communicator. And a lot of people think, well, that's great. Tell it like it is. Not always. I heard, I heard a Methodist bishop say one time, you can kill somebody with the truth. Mm-hmm. You can't handle the truth. <laughs> or you're beating them over the head with it. Yeah. Uh, or what if, what if they don't want to share? What if you see somebody that's mentally, you can tell is mentally, uh, well, mentally upset or, um, and, and you ask them, is there some way I can help? And they don't want to share. Do you, you don't, do you push yourself on them? Do you insist on I, helping? I wouldn't think so. <laughs> I would think that it's that, that wellness is always self-directed. That's what they teach at Mental Health of America. Let a person's wellness be self-directed. Listening to me is, is some of it is asking the right question. Uh, and, and it's a question that's always open-ended and seeks to find out what's going yeah. on with them before it asks them to quantify what can I do. Just tell me what's going on with you. Uh, I've had a, a, a gal I've been messaging with in California over the weekend, and I asked her this morning, because this is what we're taught to do, ask someone, are you suicidal? Mm -hmm. In that, are you mm -hmm. suicidal? Mm -hmm. and, and the next question is, are you talking with anyone? Mm -hmm. And they don't mind that. They don't mind being asked. So sometimes it's an awareness of how to interact with a diversity of, of conditions or situations. You said they don't mind. She didn't mind. Right. <laughs> she, go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm, you could be, um, you could ask that question to a person and they, that you could lose them forever also, I think. But I mean, specifically I could, with regard to suicidal people or people who potentially might be suicidal, not the people in general. People in general, yes. But in the case of a, a potential crisis, if someone was suicidal, you, you wouldn't say, oh, I better not ask them if they're suicidal. The, you know, the best advice is ask them. I'm just going with what, uh, Dean, you're smiling, the biggest smile. Well, I'm, I'm thinking now, given this conversation, what do we as church, in this instance, one particular church, 
what can we do, to, what can we offer to people to help them know how to navigate these situations? Not to, not to the, the professionals in our midst, but to Yedermann, to every person in that body. What can we offer as a, in, in the form of, of training, of seminar, of ways of thinking? What can we offer? We do want to do some more training, and this is a part of the A2A that we're going through, is that we're setting up training, mm -hmm. ongoing training, with our um, in-house people. Mm -hmm. And when I say in-house, I don't mean in-house staff. I mean people who go to that church, whether you're a member or not. Uh, it could be that we expand it to other churches if we can get the mm -hmm. form together. But, uh, I mean, when you're in a large group, you may not want to speak up. And one of the things that we do offer at St. John is that um, there is an announcement that at the end of the service, somebody will be down at a certain point in our church that if you need individual prayers or something mm -hmm. like that, that's a little bit on the uh, uh, a way to, if somebody is having a need, but they don't want to speak up in the middle of a church and cause attention to them. They mm -hmm. want to slightly go. So we, 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 hand, we try to handle it with kid gloves. Those people who handle that particular ministry at our church, they are trained for those needs. Um, not all of them are healthcare workers. A lot of them are healthcare workers at, at, at some point, so they know how to um, see the signs if something uh, needs immediate attention mm -hmm. or is this something that it's just a conversation that we need to have with this person and start building bridges. So we try to handle that a bit uh, through a, um, I can't think of it off the top of my head what they call that. Down by the prayer Baptist chaplain, Church. prayer chaplain, mm -hmm. um, you know, so that quietly you can say, "Hey, I might need a little bit of help." Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the prayer chaplains have resources at, at their attention that they know how to direct things to uh, to get maybe services that is needed. One of the things that I think is that St. John does that I think is a really nice thing is that. We have the time when we share the peace, and everyone gets up and and you know goes around and mm -hmm. and shakes everyone's hand or hugs them or as Dale said, some people don't want to be hugged, but you know it's a way to get to know some people. And I remember um, we had been there for a few weeks, and there they didn't have that one uh, one service. And Pastor Keith said. Someone said that they thought that was, you know, a disturbance to the, to the service. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, you know. But I think that's a wonderful way to get to know people. And I have, in those little seconds of going around and saying things, I have learned more about people in, in minuscule times than I probably would ever have known about them had we all just sat there in our assigned seat it, seats. Well, <laughs> the, the, and I, and I want to make a comment. <laughs> you know, the, the mission of NeuroSparks, which is the s sponsoring organization for this program, is to, to network social engagement. Mm -hmm. And it's been said accurately, in my opinion, that the tremendous division in this country at the moment, mm -hmm. without being partisan in any way is because we've become less socially engaged with one another. Mm -hmm. we've, we've become disengaged and don't have as much contact. Church, once upon a time, and maybe still can be, was the, the place that the whole community got its leadership from. Not just at church, but politicians, parent-teacher organizations, professional memberships, mm -hmm. the AMA, social workers, whomever, tended, tended to be church people. And so the point is we take home with us, not just we've made references at the facility in the worship service and so forth. It's also important what we take home mm -hmm. from church. Where'd you learn that? Well, I learned that at church how to interact, and what, you know, uh, 
I'm, it could come from anywhere. Sometimes, you know, I'm on the autism spectrum. There was someone in proximity to me that was behaving strangely, just unfriendly, just would not make eye contact, would not be friendly. I spoke, and finally, after about a year, I gave up. Said, go on with yourself. And somebody else said, I wonder if they could be, have Asperger's, could be on the autism spectrum. I am on the, and I didn't realize. I didn't, sometimes at church, we get reminders of things. Mm -hmm. Memory joggers. Mm -hmm. We remember what's important, and we take it home. I'm just, I hope we take it home. I hope that's things, lessons are learned of how to engage and interact with the larger community. I also think, too, with having that every week with the people and exchanging with people, you can you can kind of monitor people that way also. You can really tell when somebody, when you get, when you, when you see someone and you greet someone every week, even though it's for a short second, you can really tell if they're not having a good day, whereas you wouldn't know otherwise. Yeah. And I mean, it seems like such a small amount of time and a small gesture, but I think it means so much. And that, that's why that church to me feels so much more like a, a family than anywhere I've ever been to church. I want to, I want to ask Dean about two experiences I've experienced in my brief chaplaincies in hospitals. Mm -hmm. Dean, I, I entered a hospital room of a dying child dad literally sitting on bed, mom in a nearby chair, and in the time that I was there, the, the child expired, mm -hmm. the child died. And you know, as a chaplain, there's, you don't say, there's nothing to say, mm -hmm. there's nothing can be said in, in such a tender, sensitive time. Mm -hmm. But finally, minutes passed, I mean 10, 15, I don't know how long it was, and there's situations you don't know what to do even though you're a professional and finally I asked would you like for me to have a prayer mm -hmm. dad politely said I wouldn't care for it thank you very much mm -hmm. at other times and you, I know you've had this experience and you've all heard this you can spend hours with someone with a loved one in crisis in the trauma bay, in the intensive care. And finally, a time comes, maybe the person has made it, maybe they haven't, regardless. You, you finally, you haven't done anything, you haven't said anything, but you say, I'm gonna go now. Is there anything I can do before I go? And they're so grateful. And you haven't said anything. And you haven't done anything. Sometimes the church is just a presence mm -hmm. in really hard situations. Some people are going to appreciate that, that you didn't try to come up with magical words. There were no words, right? Mm -hmm. exactly. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go and be present. I'm going to go and facilitate memory. Sometimes that's all we can do. And a lot of times that's everything. Mm -hmm. And especially people with disabilities who don't fix me. You know, mm -hmm. We don't know how long this is gonna go on and we don't know how long I've got and all kinds of questions. There are no answers. Come share with me not knowing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, that's perfectly put. Be with me in my ignorance. I want to thank you all for, for doing this today. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. And um, God's continued blessing on the wonderful work you're doing. I know that, that God will continue to smile on you. And I, I, I can't thank you enough. Thank you very much. We will be back again in the not-so-distant future. I want to thank our viewers 
and for tuning in and, and gracing us with your presence. We hope that you will stay tuned, uh, not only to what people with disabilities teach us, but follow us on Facebook with NeuroSparks and be attuned to opportunities there and on our, face, or on our website. Uh, so thank you very much once again for being with us today. I'm Mike Delaney, your host. Mm -hmm.